Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Um, good, good morning. Uh, back in Bogota, I, I, I understand it's still morning there. Here in Belgium, it's afternoon, evening. Many speakers are all over the world, but it's fantastic to be with you. I'm so sad I can't be in Bogota for the whole conference. Uh, you're but, mute. Yeah, we're hearing you now. Okay, good. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. So uh, delighted to be here to moderate this panel. I'm Jos Paulin, a professor of law at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. And we have uh, five amazing panelists with us to, to tackle a big, really big issue, the future of multilateralism in times of geopolitical confrontation and geoeconomic fragmentation. I understand this is the overarching theme of the conference and many of the issues may have been discussed already, but we will try to um, tackle these questions from, from a variety of perspectives. We have uh, five panelists, so we'll have to really uh, time manage because we have um, an hour and a few minutes. Um, I will list the panelists in alphabetical order, starting with Minister uh, Dukun An, the Minister for Trade of the Republic of Korea. And of course, in our circles, also very well known as a professor, as an academic, professor of international trade law and policy um, in the Graduate School of International Studies at Seoul National University. Um, Minister An was telling us he's in the middle of IPEF negotiations, so really delighted he's making some time for us. Um, next is Ignacio uh, Garcia Bercero, who's joining us from Brussels. Ignacio is well, very well known in trade circles, works for the European Commission. Uh, as a director in the Directorate General for Trade there. Uh, next is uh, Ambassador Minister Celso Laffer, who uh, we were just chatting, a, a, a true legend in Geneva from the early days of the WTO. Um, a real honor to have you on the panel. He's also Professor Emeritus um, of the Sao Paulo Law School, former Brazilian Minister of Foreign Relations and, and former Ambassador of Brazil to the WTO and to the UN in Geneva. Next is Cleet Willems, um, who's now a, a partner with the law firm of Aiken Gump. But as you all know, he served in the White House. Uh, before that, as deputy assistant to the president for international economics, deputy director of the National Economic Council and part of the National Security Council under the uh, Trump presidency. Um, wonderful to have you here and to have a, a US voice in this debate as well. Uh, last but not least, we have um, Professor Zhao, Professor Hong Zhao, who is a professor of law at the uh, Peking Law School. And many of you will know her also as a former chair of the appellate body, a former minister counselor in charge of legal affairs at China's mission to the WTO and a former commissioner for trade negotiations at the Chinese Ministry of Commerce uh, Department for WTO Affairs. So we have a wonderful lineup here. Uh, we did cheat a little bit. We've been exchanging some questions, some ideas to have a streamlined discussion. So the plan is that I will ask three questions and then give the floor to three or four people specifically. Uh, each of them will get three minutes to give their main points. And then I will ask others to, to comment if they, if they wish. So, <clears throat> so let me start with, um, with the first question which focuses on, on the geopolitics of, of the debate. In 1989, and this has been repeated many times, but I think it's a good starting point, uh, Francis Fukuyama spoke of the end of history. And a few years later, in 1994, the WTO was created, but now 34 years later, the ideo ideological divide between countries seems greater and more permanent than ever. Recently, some went as far as calling for a NATO for trade under which democratic rule of law nations agree to come to each other's economic aid against an outside adversary. In the context of such ideological divide, which finds trade expression via national security interventions, sanctions and export controls, subsidy races and tech wars, is there really any hope for a stable multilateral rules-based system? That's my first sub-question. Now, if, if there is any such hope, which interface mechanisms exist or ought to be put in place that respect such ideological differences, but allow for at least some trade flows to continue? 
And here's my third sub question. Or is the emergence of separate fragmented trading zones and supply chains, say one including countries like China or Russia, and another excluding them, inevitable, at least for some products and services? So on that geopolitical national security question, I'd like to turn first to uh, uh, Minister An for his comments. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I'm uh, very honored to join this uh, wonderful panel and uh, to meet many of my uh, the former friends uh, over the Zoom. Well, this critical issue of how to sustain a stable multilateral rule-based system in the current geopolitical situation depends on whether and how the WTO can deal with the national security questions. From uh, now a policymaker point of view, uh, we're in entirely different world trading system. Until maybe a decade ago, uh, the whole trade policies have been devised and implemented firmly on the basis of non-discrimination principle. General exception clauses are very cautiously uh, invoked for special circumstances and national security exceptions was not even uh, within the scope of consideration. Nowadays, trade security, economic security, or more broadly uh, speaking, national security concerns prevail over most of economic and trade policy elements. So IPF supply chain agreement concluded in the last May is probably a uh, prominent example to illustrate urgency of 14 key trading nations policy policymakers. So national security exception, or uh, put it differently, economic security principle will play an important role as much as non-discrimination principle in the world trading system of the coming decades. In my view, uh, one feasible way to handle this problem uh, is to interpret more flexibly Article 21b3 provision that permits security action taken, quote unquote, in time of other emergency in international relations. Instead of being confined to the narrow context of the Second World War, the WTO should embrace the current geopolitical reality of international economic relationship, even with the existing textual languages. That way, we will be able to maintain a stable multilateral rule-based system without provoking controversial political question of whether non-market economies fit for the WTO system. I'll stop here. Thank you, very interesting. So you really, jump straight into the national security issue and, and calling for a broader interpretation of that exception clause. Professor Zhao, you, you, can you share with us your views? Because it's it's no secret that the, the position of China in this whole debate is, is crucial. And your views, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Yust. And uh, I think I'd like to thank the uh, Society of International Economic Law in organizing this event which provide opportunity for us to communicate. And also, uh, you know, thanks for you to uh, pose this important uh, question. I think for me, uh, the question I think is about whether still there's a hope for the future uh, multilateralism based on rules. Uh, for me, even in times of uh, geopolitical tensions and uh, the um, economic fragmentations, I think there's a hope. There's a hope and at least we should cherish that hope. And uh, though stableness may be a luxury, maybe for the time being. So most likely, I think it is because of the interdependence of the economies with each other. I think it is uh, most likely that the, uh, the connecting, the, the, the members will be still connecting with each other. And I believe the multilateralism is still the mainstream uh, leveling field uh, for the majority of world trade. Um, and at least we have this institution 
the World Trade Organization and its secretariat to keep it uh, for running. And uh, as you recognize, there are small steps, uh, you know, uh, though not big, uh, moving forward. The trade facilitation agreement, the investment facilitation uh, agreement completed the uh, the, the, the uh, negotiations on the the test. So I think they uh, they will continue to work, but obviously there are huge challenges to the the, the institution uh, these days. First and foremost is dispute settlement, and we uh, though we understand there are difficulties and the uh, the challenges and you know differences uh, remain huge. Uh, the good sign is members started to uh, exchange views uh, over this matter, and the 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 uh, ministers of uh, MC12 also call upon members to discuss to uh, to come to a uh, the um, with a view to uh, to come back to a fully functioning dispute settlement uh, body accessible to all members by 2024. So let's wait and see what that will turn turn out. And I agree with uh, Minister Ann who mentioned national security. Maybe that is another thorny issue that torture this organization. But I think the, uh, the, the, the it is a highly, uh, for me, it is a highly uh, technical issue. Uh, maybe others don't agree, but the uh, national security of GATT and WTO totally different from national security ordinary people understood. As we'll understand, 20, Article 21 is a wartime national security provision. It allows members to self-judge, but only in the, uh, the time of war or other international emergencies. And for peaceful time, there are general exceptions, Article 20, which allow members to deviate from rules in peaceful times for the sake of uh, health, life, security, the conservation of resources, the protection of IP, et cetera. And Article 11 of GET allow for the food security uh, and Article 14 allow for the exchange rate security concerns for, for member to, to resolve its concerns. So for me, I think the, uh, if we uh, allow as someone suggested to, uh, in evolution interpretation of Article 21, uh, it seems to me that this provision will replace or could replace all other provisions and it's easily to be abused. With that, it, it is very worrisome for uh, how that will be uh, affect the, uh, the future of this uh, multilateral trading system. So on this point, I think somehow, I mean, not uh, see eyes with eyes uh, with uh, Minister M, and I guess we can have more discussion in that regard later on. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, very interesting. So as you said, there's already a bit of a difference um, in views, but, but interesting that you have a more positive vision, focus also on national security and then uh, dispute settlement. <clears throat> I want to turn to Ambassador Laffer, because as I mentioned, I, I think um, my question is nothing new. I remember reading John Jackson's early book, and he also, he, he already spoke of interface mechanisms. And that that is the, the real magic of, of the GATT WTO. How, how can we find mechanisms for countries with very different economic systems to trade nonetheless? Um, uh, Ambassador Laffer, you had some ideas looking at the bigger picture even, other international organizations. Please. Thank you, Josh. Well, <clears throat> of course, the landscape today is different from the one we faced when the setting up of the WTO. I think a rules-based multilateral system as conceived by the Marrakesh Agreement uh, had a, a view that the issues of trade were conflicts of interest, not conflicts of conception of how to organize the international economic order. Today, we are facing uh, an erosion of the locus standi of the WTO because in the view of many of the WTO members, these rules do not uh, calibrate 
the needs of these countries. And that, of course, is related to the issues of uh, uh, national policy space, environment, and of course, the security issues that were raised uh, that come to the forefront. So my idea uh, is to develop interface mechanisms. The Marrakesh Agreement contemplates uh, interface mechanisms through cooperations with other international organizations and non-governmental organizations that deal with matters that are of uh, within the realm of the WTO. When the WTO was created, the emphasis was on the IMF and the World Bank. Obviously, this is very insufficient to face the very significant problems we now have to deal. Uh, but the Marrakesh Agreement contemplates these mechanisms of interface. And I think this is something that incrementally we should do. This is part of a damage control of the assets of the WTO. And in this sense, I think one of the advantages of this interface mechanism is the transparency of information that they can bring forth. You know? uh, to be informed is to be free. And obviously the experience of the WTO has always been on the merits of transparency, from the trade policy review mechanisms to the issues of notification. So my first suggestion, uh, which is a modest suggestion, is to increase interface mechanisms and bring through these interface mechanisms an increase of information that will uh, help predictability. Uh, one final comment. Uh, we are not dealing with the situation of the 1930s of the last uh, century where trade was uh, circumscribed by political circumstances. We are dealing with trade that faces the issue of fragmentation, but where trade continues to flow. So it is under this very real fact that I believe that these interface mechanisms might help damage control of the assets of an organization as significant as the WTO has in its tradition and its experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Very interesting. A uh, conflict of interests and, and conflicts of conceptions of, of how the system should operate. So um, we have more opportunities to come back to these issues, but I, I wanted to just make sure that uh, Clita and Ignacio can also jump in here. Um, of course, you, you represent, uh, I know you're not speaking on their behalf, but you speak from uh, two continents, basically, who, who built the system, more or less, and, and who now face difficulties uh, playing within that sandbox. Cleet, I don't know, can I ask you to, to give some feedback? Sure, uh, I would be happy to do so, and, and I'm, I'm happy to be here with so many other distinguished uh, speakers. Um, so uh, thank you for that opportunity. Let me use, I want, I want to go back in some ways to the way that you originally framed your question, because I think it's important. And, and you asked whether there is some inevitability here that we are going to have a fragmentation of supply chains. And, and I, I think there is. I, I do. I, I think it's already happening. I, I think we can't ignore it. And I think if we pretend it's not happening or we wish it weren't happening, um, we will inhibit our ability to come up with pragmatic solutions. So I do think we have to recognize that for certain products, certain types of trade, uh, we are going to have greater fragmentation. Uh, that said, um, I will still say I am optimistic that there is an important role that the multilateral trading system can play. And I think as, as we're talking about this issue in the United States, and I know as many other countries are confronting similar issues around the world, you know, there are areas of trade where things are going to be more difficult. They are um, colored with national security concerns, but there are other areas where that doesn't and shouldn't exist. And so I think on these certain areas, we have to be realistic that if we try to force them into the system, we will break it. 
But on the other hand, where those same issues are not present, we should be doing absolutely everything we can to further liberalize trade between us, to make sure that we're all respecting each other on a non-discriminatory basis and playing by the rules. So I, I really do think that disaggregation is going to be important um, for the system to, to be able to function uh, moving forward. Let me just comment then briefly. I mean, you know, it, it may be difficult um, conceptually to say, here's where we draw the line, and this is one of those issues that's outside, and this is one of those issues that's inside. And, and that may need to happen on somewhat of an ad hoc basis or even a dispute by dispute basis. And that's where this question of invoking national security often comes in, into play. Um, I, I do think that um, we need to allow countries where there are true, true national security issues to be able to raise that. Um, but we also want to make sure that it's not done in a non-discretionary um, uh, fashion that just absorbs the entire system. And so I've been thinking a lot about this as this has come up in, in, in recent disputes. And I actually think what you would want to do is to create a system where if a country decides early on that this for them is national security um, and it should not be adjudicated um, by a panel and then ultimately the appellate body, if, if, if we restore the appellate body, um, that you have somewhat of an off ramp. So you aren't adjudicating it to the end, but you're also not just saying, okay, national security, we're gonna go home. Can you then move that into another track where there is some sort of mechanism where you try to um, help the parties come to some understanding and prevent retaliation from getting out of control, which is I think part of the original intent of the system. And so I would just propose, I think the system um, can still play a healthy role. I think we need to recognize there are some issues that aren't best dealt with um, through the system, but maybe it can still play a role in helping on a different track to prevent those from spiraling. So let me just, just stop there. Hopefully that was a, a helpful contribution and, and, and gives people some food for thought. Yeah, very interesting. So I, yeah, to see that for, for some products, there'll be different supply chains for others. We can build on the multilateral system, but I, I'm very glad you went one step further trying to think about where to draw the line and, and who should do that. Ignacio, you've been thinking about these issues for for months, years, if not decades. Uh, what's your view? Uh, well, I'm not sure that I have been thinking about this for decades, but certainly it's one of the critical questions that we are facing right now as we are discussing the, how to reform the WTO. Now, the first point which I would like uh, to make is that contrary to the view that because we are living in the days of your political conflicts, uh, the WTO is becoming less relevant, I would make exactly the opposite argument. Precisely because we are living in days of geopolitical conflict, the costs of a non-functioning multilateral trading system are much higher. And that's why, despite all the difficulties and all the challenges, I think that the perspective of needing to reform the WTO, it is a huge political priority. And very recently, when the European Commission put forward a document suggesting a strategy on economic security, we indicated that for us, a world functioning WTO, including a world functioning dispute settlement system, is a core component of our economic security. This being said, I think we need to look at the world as it is. And I would agree with Clit that some degree of fragmentation is unavoidable. There is going to be more recourse to actions linked to economic security, to national security. That's a reality that we are going to be facing. And there are very delicate questions on which, quite frankly, I don't have an answer, and I don't certainly not in a position to tell you today what is the right answer, is how to recognize that reality while avoiding the risk of abuse of the national security exception. Is this an issue to be solved fundamentally through WTO dispute settlement cases? Are there other mechanisms in the WTO to try to contain the risk of abuse, to create culverts against the abuse of the national security exception? I don't think that there's a very clear answer on that. It's something that we are all very much reflecting at this point in time. But as I said, the reality is that we are going to be seeing more invocations of national security, but the only, not only B3, there's also B2 which so far has not been adjudicated, but which may be even more relevant than B3 in a number of circumstances. 
and we really need to see how to ensure there are effective guardrails to prevent uh, an abuse of the national security exception, while at the same time recognizing that governments are inevitably going to be taking a number of every actions on, to protect uh, uh, national security, and that this is going to become a more important part of the global trading system that has been the case in the past. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, Minister yeah. Anne, Professor Zhao, Ambassador yeah. Laffer, perhaps a quick response. Minister Anne, I know that you, you started off saying national security should be interpreted more broadly. Um, Professor Zhao pushed back a little bit. We, we had debates on, um, I think everyone realizes there's a need for countries to have that policy space. The big question is, where do you draw the line? Any any further views? Well, um, now there's one dilemma is, uh, theoretically, we say that uh, the, the military uh, situation should be uh, dealt by Article 21, National Security uh, the Exception. Uh, whereas the commercial relationship should be still handled by the WTO normal trade rule. But if you think about what, what is occurring nowadays is when we designate some, some uh, industry sector as a strategically, a strategically important sector for the economy, whatever that means, then whether it can be semiconductor, whether it can be advanced uh, the, the AI or uh, quantum computing, or even like uh, the, the advanced, advanced like manufacturing capacity for steel or whatever, that can be completely national security considerations. So nowadays, it, instead of like uh, focusing on particular phase of manufacturing or process of manufacturing, we still try to designate designate whole broad scope of industry sector under the name of the, the national security uh, exceptions. So uh, the under current situations, uh, that is why basically, uh, why I uh, raised that uh, issue. Unless we have to find a way to interpret uh, at least that particular <laughs> seemingly confusing or uh, the flexible expressions in the current text, and it will take a long time to come up with a new uh, the rules or ways to embrace or incorporate the current reality of the international relations. Professor Zhao, I saw your hand up very briefly, if you can. Yes, I think there's a the uh, very good discussions uh, from Professor uh, Mr. An and uh, Ignacio and uh, Klee. I think they would remind me about the um, the the, the so-called semiconductor sector is that um, it is for some country it is under the uh, export control. So let's take the export control policy, uh, which is usually connected with uh, national security issues and for door use or whatever. Now the situation is quite complicated, but I think for that, what reminds me it is is that uh, for me, uh, the we say that the World Trade Organization is a liberal market, uh, you know, uh, economy uh, in prevail, and uh, we. But export control somehow to me is a kind of a planned economy, economy in control, the government come into intervention. So basically there's, for me, there's a conflict uh, of uh, concept in managing the econo uh, economics, why it is high tech, why it is uh, most important in technology or sensitive areas, uh, it is controlled. So basically for me, that is why I would like to come to the connection with uh, the so-called non-market economy issue. I know the end, the, the purposes of uh, Minister An is to try to, uh, to use uh, national security provision to save the problem of uh, non-market economy. But for me, the, uh, all the economy somehow after the super globalization of 40 years is market economy. There's only degree of uh, differences, how much 
there's a hand of the government and there's a hand of the market. I think for most of the market, uh, it is we have liberal market economy, social market economy, and market economy with socialist characteristics, but they are they are market economies. And it is, I think, for the for the major economies, that is the situation to me. So if we say that there's a future of the multilateralism, we can have rules to consider to formulate rules, reform the current rules, whatever, to embrace all these economies and to let them compete on the same leveling field. That is the that is somehow to me uh, the future of the uh, multilateralism. Thank you. Yeah, there was a, a Wall Street op-ed the other day calling U.S. economic policy Chinese uh, capitalism with American characteristics, <laughs> which I thought was an interesting turn of phrase. Um, Ambassador Laffer, you you want to have a, a final go at this or can we turn to the, the second question? Very quickly. Uh, obviously, security issues are related to the specific concerns of many countries, as has been uh, right now raised. <clears throat> but uh, the issue of, of security is related to many of the considerations we need to do regarding the WTO. National policy space, for instance, can be seen in terms of economic development or economic issues that can also be seen in terms of security. And that, of course, includes offshoring, friendly shoring, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what seems to be is that this division in the world seen today, where security's issue looms so high, is difficult to obtain a division between what is a security issue and what is a, shall we say, trade economic uh, issue within our vision of the functioning of the WTO without uh, uh, facing the issues that the economies are very different in the way they are organized and the uh, problem of one size does not fit all uh, in the rules that we are thinking about. Wonderful, thank you. Let's let's turn to question two, uh, and we'll have opportunity to come back to these issues. I hope we can have a Q and A. Uh, by the way, I hope the organizers can collect some questions, or I can look at the at the chat box. So, putting aside national security for a moment, uh, I think another big theme that that really permeates uh, trade debates today is uh, sustainability, uh, and it's it's becoming another divide between countries which again risk upsetting and fragmenting supply chains, climate change, sustainability imperatives. And there may be broad agreement on, on long-term goals, um, how to get there and who needs to do what and when, that remains very controversial. So here as well, in the face of lack of progress multilaterally, some countries have started to enforce sustainability goals at the border autonomously. Um, I'm thinking especially of the EU with, with many initiatives that they have enacted. There's also talk of a, a climate club or a steel club. The EU and the US are debating this, under which like-minded countries would trade certain products on certain terms to the exclusion of others. And we're not talking about national security now, but really um, sustainable steel or um, supply chains that would become fragmented based on um, climate change uh, targets, deforestation, forced labor, due diligence standards. Um, so here again, you may have one market for products that meet EU standards and another market for those that, that do not. Now, it, is this sustainability challenge, is it qualitatively different from the political ideological challenge that we just discussed? So that would be my, my first question. And my second sub question is, what is the role and scope for multilateral rules and approaches in that area? So I, I think we, we, we had very interesting views on how to deal with uh, security issues in the multilateral system, sustainability, there as well we have very different approaches. Is there a role, a different role for the WTO or the multilateral system there as opposed to the, the geopolitics? And I know, Ignacio, you had some, some views on this, so I want to turn to you first, if I may. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, thanks a lot, uh, Joss, with pleasure. Let me start perhaps by putting the issue in context, because I think if there is one fundamental challenge that we are facing at this point in time is how to achieve the transition to net zero. And that's going to be, the next 10 years is going to be absolutely critical to be able to fulfill the, this uh, objective. That means that there has to be ways of decarbonizing the, those sectors which are highly exposed to international trade. And countries are going to take uh, different approaches, different levels of ambition to, to achieve those goals. Even when countries may have the same ambition, they are going to do it through different tools. Some are going to rely more on carbon pricing. Some may rely more on regulation. Some may rely more on subsidies. And how you mix all of those uh, elements is going to have a huge economic impact. So I think this is certainly going to be a fundamental issue uh, for the global trading system. And I think clearly this calls for an enhanced role for the WTO. I'm not suggesting that what you need to do is to negotiate uh, new rules. I don't think necessarily that is the route to follow, but you certainly need to have a much stronger role of the WTO as a forum for deliberating on the interaction between trade and these global environmental challenges. And I see two fundamental issues that would need to be discussed in the Committee on Trade and Environment and in other bodies in the WTO. The first one is the whole question of trade-related environmental measures. CIVAN, but not only CIVAN, CIVAN has just been a, bit, uh, a, a first measure which has been adopted in this connection. There are going to be others, and you need to have discussions on these issues in the WTO, certainly to ensure transparency, but beyond the issue of transparency, also to see how to try to promote more compatibility between different approaches to achieve decarbonization. And that's a discussion that has started in the context of the Committee on Trade and Environment in the WTO. And it is certainly something that we would wish to see more about it and a more reinforced deliberative role for the WTO. Now, we have been designing our measures very consciously in a manner that we consider to be WTO compatible. It has been a very significant effort in the design to ensure that they are not discriminatory. But beyond the question of legality, we really need to have a way of discussing the implementation of those measures, discussing how to foster compatibility between different approaches towards achieving the decarbonization. And the WTO certainly has a role to play on this. The other big challenge is, of course, uh, subsidies. Now, subsidies can have uh, a negative impact on the environment, can have a positive impact on the environment. And clearly, there are risks about subsidy basis. There are risks of tensions and conflicts linked to subsidization. And again, we need to be able to have, as a first stage, more discussion about these issues in the WTO. And to be very clear, I'm not talking only about industrial subsidies, or fossil fuel subsidies. I'm also talking about agricultural subsidies. So I think that needs to be a way to look into a matrix to what extent uh, certain subsidies have a negative impact both on trade and the environment. Where are the areas where you have a trade-off? You can argue that a certain subsidy may have a positive environmental impact, but a significant negative impact on trade. And you may, of course, have subsidies that if they are well designed are positive from the point of view of the environment, but also have minimal impact on trade. And I think this is the kind of discussion that we need to begin to have in the WTO, to have a stronger deliberation upon those matters. As I said, at this point in time, without prejudicing where the outcome of this has to be negotiation of rules, maybe it is something less than the negotiation of rules, but you need to start by having a proper deliberation about those matters in the WTO. Thank you, very interesting and, and not surprising that, that the EU perspective on this is um, is what you just said, uh, Cleet. I want to I want to turn to you because the the current U.S. administration, of course, has put greening the economy top of the agenda, has engaged in subsidization, some other initiatives. Do you think that there is a role on these issues for for a multilateral set of rules or? Yeah, absolutely, I, I do, and. I would draw a clear distinction uh, between the national security issues. And if, if you think about problems around climate versus problems around national security, issues with climate are inherently a communal problem. 
Um, it is something that no one country is, is, is immune to more than any other. It's something that no one country can fix on its own. Um, we can do everything in, we can in the United States to be more climate conscious, but if our neighbors aren't doing the same thing, we just absolutely haven't solved the problem. And if you distinguish that with national security, national security is inherently driven by where you are and where you sit. You know, my definition of a national security uh, problem for the United States is very different than the other panelists for their own countries and economies. Um, so I, I, I do draw a clear distinction here. I think this is something that must be dealt with in the system. And I think within that context, it should be right at the top of our list. Um, you know, I, I am concerned that this does have the potential to be the next great, you know, sort of trade war uh, between a lot of different countries and, 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 and including the US and the EU. You know, the US and the EU are negotiating on some of these issues right now, um, but we're very concerned um, that those may not uh, come to fruition. We may be in a situation where we aren't treating each other uh, equally, and that and that can lead to a lot of tension. And you can see that then proliferating throughout the whole world. And remember, unlike some of the other issues we were talking about before, this doesn't just apply to one sector or one type of good. I mean, this is cross economy. Um, so you could really have, I think, a major issue here. In terms of what the WTO might be able to achieve, I think Ignacio is onto something. Um, do we need to get full-fledged rule sets across all these areas? I mean, I, it would be nice and we should try, but I think short of that, we should absolutely want to use the WTO as a forum to discuss these things at a high level. Um, so there's transparency, so we avoid um, unnecessary discrimination. And then I also think to the extent we can hash out some principles um, around what we're doing from, from you know, carbon border adjustments and things like that, that would be good. And of course, I would also say that the existing rules can be applied um, to different subsidies and things that people may think are discriminatory. You know, you still have those rules in place that can be, that can be utilized. Um, the last point I wanna make, just to use a little bit of a panelist prerogative here, is just to comment quickly on, on some of the things said earlier on the previous discussion um, about the national security issues and sort of this notion that, you know, because we all intervene in, in our economy to a certain degree, you know, any intervention should be, should be fair game. And I think, look, I would say the degree of intervention is very important. And we already have rules in the WTO that do permit for some intervention in the economy, but don't permit for other kinds of invention in, in the economy. And so I think we want to distinguish the degree of intervention is important. And I would also point out, it's really not just a question of non-market economy versus market economy from an economic perspective, but I think there's also a distinction between sort of the role of government actors within the individualized decisions of companies. And, and, and the question of, is there a clear separation between public and private sectors? Um, and that's another element here that I think uh, doesn't lend itself to the, to the kind of you know, straightforward approach that you might see in other areas. Um, so thank you for the indulgence and I hope the other part of the answer was helpful as well. Thank you, uh, great lead. Ambassador Laffer, of course, you, you represented a, a large emerging economy. Uh, sustainability for, for your country is you've also had a change in, in government. So th there's a lot of movement there, but you, you, Brazilian exports could be at the receiving end of say the EU deforestation initiative. H how do you look at at the sustainability imperative and, and the role of the WTO there? Let me start going backwards. It was the 1992 Rio conference that effectively inserted the issues of sustainable development in the world agenda. And the results of the Rio conference were the Climate Convention and the Biodiversity Convention, which were the first and still most significant uh, multilateral environment uh, uh, dispositions, as well as the uh, Rio Declaration on the Environment and Sustainable Development. Accordingly, the preamble of the Marrakesh Agreement inserted uh, sustainable development as one of its aims, though the WTO did not create rules specifically dealing with it, but dealt with them according to its own rule. The first case, which I participated, was the reformulated gasoline 
issue between the United States, Brazil, and Venezuela. And the issue we raised successfully was that it was not an environmental measure, it was a discriminatory measure. So all these issues come very clearly to the forefront. Now, climate change and uh, biodiversity convention have increased commitments of countries, but most of these commitments are of a different nature than those that we are used to deal within the WTO. And one of the important things is that uh, in the issue of the environment, the basic stimulus for change has been science and technology, starting with the EPCC, which was, of course, the basis for the climate convention and for all the advances we have had. Now, this brings me to the point I would like to raise, is that all these issues related to the environment, when applied to trade, are technical rules. There is a diplomacy of standards. And the diplomacy of standards uh, means also that one size does not fit all. If one looks at the Rio Declaration, it has two very interesting points, which I think are a very appropriate peace directiva that should be uh, bear in mind. Basically, the technical norms of non-tariff disciplines related to trade policy measures for environmental purposes, aiming at the attainment of a green economy, should not uh, bring trade discrimination. So the issue here is obviously the issue of trade discrimination. As my friends here have related the issue of security as one of the main concerns, the main concerns of a large emerging economy and export economy based also on its agri agricultural competitiveness means that these technical standards, this diplomacy of standards should be a very significant dimension of our concerns. One size does not, fit, uh, does not fit all. Agriculture in a tropical country is different from agriculture in a temperate country. Climate change affects us all, but the way we deal with climate change is also related to the specificity of the country. So I think that one of the basic points today is that uh, we are faced and we have been baffled by the general difficulties of harmonization and fragmentation. And they should be supported change by the ever increasing knowledge of science and technology capable of addressing the different specificity of countries. So my point here is that shared technological information as the one the EPCC represents in terms of climate change should be one of the aims of the trade uh, and environment uh, uh, discussions within the WTO. We are obviously facing a major crisis uh, climate disruption, the biodiversity loss, uh, and everything that comes to the forefront. But the unilateralism of the diplomacy of standards requires a different diplomatic approach. And the support for a diplomacy of standards is and should be based on science and technology, which means, of course, that you have more than one way to deal with these problems. And I think this should be in the forefront. Thank you, Ambassador, very interesting. So I, I see Cleet and Ignacio both um, advocating for a, a serious role of, of the WTO here, non-discrimination. Uh, Ambassador Laffer to, yeah, pushing it back a little bit against the EU autonomous instruments. I like your term of diplomacy of standards. We have about five minutes left before we turn to Q&A, 
but I want to give a, a chance to to uh, to Minister Anne and Professor Zhao to quickly jump in if they want to on sustainability. Yeah. Please, Professor Zhao. Uh, thanks very much. I think the uh, we and I just want to uh, agree with uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Lafer that uh, the unilateralism is still a uh, kind of a threat to the uh, multilaterally uh, treating system. The and I understand fully with Ignacio that the European Union take the measure on decarbonization uh, as a systematic approach and the. Uh, CBOM is only one of one piece of its instrument that has been taken. But for me, uh, by nature, I think this unilateral uh, action, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. And, uh, and I think basically it effectively raising the standard of carbon neutralization of imported goods from developing countries to that of the same of the EU. I think that is somehow maybe, uh, you know, to me, uh, maybe there are chances that uh, we could find alternative, uh, less trade restrictive uh, method in doing so. And for me, encouraging transfer of relevant technology to developing countries may be more important and effective than collecting tariffs uh, on the border. And I also agree with the idea of uh, reviving the, uh, the new uh, the green subsidy uh, within the uh, SM agreement. That is a brief comment on, on the subject matter. I definitely agree sustainability is a common threat to mankind and there are a variety of uh, sustainability issues, not only climate change, biodiversity, the clean water, even the gap between rich and poor. And, you know, for all the the former three, uh, it is a global challenge. And for the rich and the poor gaps, it is of domestic regime. That matters because it is we didn't resolve that matter well at home. So we do not have a strong support uh, from you know, the middle classes or the, the, uh, the low income uh, people uh, at home to support globalization. So we have to resolve all these uh, issues, um, uh, both at home and internationally. Thank, Thank you. you. So we 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 have a few minutes. We, we got a few minutes extra from the organizers, and that's okay with the panelists. So I, I would like to give each of you a final word before we could return to the QA. And I'd like you to do so through the lens of my third question, which moves away from substantive issues like national security, geopolitics, sustainability, and tries to look a bit more at, at the, the architecture, the DNA of the WTO and how they've been doing business, how they um, how their decision-making process works. So trying to contrast just how difficult it is to get anything done at the WTO with the consensus rule. Why is it that for some other issues, as we speak, there seems to be more consensus on negotiating a pandemic treaty in the WHO or Countries are making pro progress to for, for a treaty to end plastic pollution at UNEP. They've concluded last December, and I think Ambassador Laffa referred to it, a global biodiversity framework, which is really massive. So in, in the face of, of those um, successes, and of course we have some limited WTO successes, the, recently the investment facilitation agreement, but I think we can all agree that compared to the, the massive challenges that the, the trading system faces, the progress has been very, very slow. So is there anything we can learn from these other negotiations or is there anything in the DNA of the WTO that needs to change uh, in the, the architecture that, that could change to facilitate progress? And I wanna start with Ambassador Anne because you are uh, in the cold phase of all of the negotiating trade deals as we speak. Minister Anne? Okay, uh, well, when the global communities address uh, the issues concerning global commons, such as pandemic and public health, climate change and environmental protection, we are still working together for global solution. But unfortunately, the value of international trade to serve global uh, concerns, such as poverty, public health, and environment is not uh, properly recognized. Only the nature of weaponized tool for economic statecraft under the Jerusalem conflict has been highlighted 
in domestic political processes of many WTO members. Despite such difficult political circumstances, uh, the WTO members still continue to make persistent progress, including MC12 package and joint statement initiative outcomes, such as services, domestic regulation, and investment facilitation agreement. In fact, the stalemate in the WTO in the recent years is not among large scale groups of membership, but rather uh, between a few strongly positioned members. Thus, the WTO should be able to uh, utilize more frequently and actively the platform of plurilateral agreement in which vast majority of like-minded WTO members can build the better structure of trade norms to timely deal with unconventional and yet increasingly uh, crucial current challenges. Uh, such a pragmatic way to develop the WTO system uh, worked in the past to make a leapfrog from GATT to WTO. Um, uh, and I, I, so hopefully uh, work to build a better WTO in the future. So let me stop here. Thank you. On my clock, you've more or less all spoken the same number of seconds, but if any of the other four um, want to jump in here very quickly, I'd like to invite you to do so now. And perhaps you can raise your hand if you want to say something, but then we, we, we can turn to Q&A and people in the room, please prepare your question. And if you are following us online, you can ask your question in the chat if you so want. Cleet, I see your hand up and Ignacio as well. Yeah, I'll be very brief. And first, just let me associate myself with a lot of Professor An's remarks. And I do think that we need to be able to do plurilaterals in a very robust way under the system. And if we're not able to do so, it will become a forum that folks don't go to to try to negotiate. And so I think that's absolutely critical. And it's OK if members of the system don't want to take on new obligations in certain areas or don't want to liberalize as much, but that shouldn't prevent others from using a multilateral system to do it, which is preferable to doing it on ad hoc, one-off uh, trade agreements and things like that. The second point I want to make, and I'm almost uncomfortable making it uh, because of its implications, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is I think there's a key distinction between the WTO and these other organizations because the WTO has an enforcement mechanism that has real implications. Uh, if you breach an agreement under the WTO and you get sued and you lose, you're going to have tariffs put on you. Um, if you violate another agreement in a different organization under good faith, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a reputational harm, but life goes on. And so I think we just have to recognize that if we have a dispute settlement system and we want to have enforceable mechanism, that's going to make it harder to reach outcomes, which is all the more reason why you need to have a healthy negotiating and dispute settlement system working together, as well as to allow for plurilaterals. So countries who are scared about that don't drag it down. Thank you, Ignacio. Well, I'm so glad to, to be able to say that I fully agree with what Keith has just uh, has just said. As three main points, uh, the fundamental difference between the WTO and other international organizations, as Keith has said, uh, is that at the core of the organization are legally binding and enforceable rules, and that's why there is something really urgent uh, in terms of the WTO is to find a way to reform dispute settlement, to have, again, a system which works, which is legitimate, which is effective. And I don't say that because uh, I'm particularly concerned about giving more business to lawyers, but because without a functioning dispute settlement system, the credibility of the rules is continuously being eroded. And I think that inevitably that means that we are going to see that those rules are increasingly not going to be respected. So that I would say, is the most urgent reform. And I think it's good that we're having very intensive discussions on that in Geneva to try to find a way forward on this few settlement reform. Secondly, you need to be able to demonstrate uh, that the WTO can deliver the new and relevant uh, trade agreements where it is multilaterally, where it is uh, plurilaterally. And I think my sense is that the more that a trade agreement can be justified uh, for broader sustainability reasons, like the fisheries subsidies agreement, or it has a strong development component, like investment facilitation for development agreement, the more that there are the chances of those agreements being concluded in the WTO. 
And the very important test that we are going to be seeing to, in the not too distant future is can we use the possibilities in the WTO to integrate plurilateral agreements to actually be able to integrate the investment facilitation for development agreement. I think will be a very important institutional te test for the WTO. The third statement is a little bit in slight contradiction to the first. While rules are the hard core of the WTO, the WTO needs to have other tools than rules. There are many, many challenges we have been facing at this point in time, which are highly complex, but it's going to be difficult to establish the normative consensus to negotiate rules, where it is multilateral or where it is plurilateral, and where you need to show that despite that, the WTO is relevant. And that's why we enforce the liberation in the WTO on some of the issues that we have been saying, discussing today, the environment, uh, subsidies, it is so critical for the credibility of the system. Hopefully, in some cases, this could create the basis to negotiate rules. But even if you don't get uh, into that point, the fact that you can debate certain issues seriously and purposefully in the WTO is going to be critical for the credibility of the organization. Thank you. Professor Zhao, very briefly. Very briefly, I think uh, I'm very glad to join uh, Klee and uh, Ignacio in agreeing that prelateral is approach to move forward for all the negotiations. And I also agree that, uh, you know, the for me, consensus may not be so such a bad thing as it represents uh, international democracy. You know, we cannot promote democracy only at home and forget about democracy internationally. So consensus is about uh, that, but the prelaterally uh, negotiating approach, the GSI, I think should be keep to be applied on MFN basis to uh, whoever would like to join. That is another sort of uh, consensus. I think that is, uh, uh, of course, we have other legality issues and we can continue to discuss. But before we conclude uh, the uh, open for questions, I'd like to stress a little bit on how I see multilateralism. You know, for me, multilateralism is a great triumph of the collaboration of mankind after two big world wars. It is a victory of human nature's good part or its evil and selfish part. It is highlight or the shining part of the human civilization. So how to, so to protect and to survive, it is just like the, uh, to pursue pursuit after the eternal kindness and goodness of mankind. So I would like to address this is because the, the, we have this, the, we didn't go deeper into that debate due to the time frame, you know, not on that front, but I want to remind everyone, it is everyone's effort in this process that will determine the future of multilateralism. That is Thanks. why I think before we try to transform the DNA of um, uh, the multilateralism, we need to understand the true spirit and the uh, the strong strong advantage of the uh, the DNA of the uh, multilateralism. To me, it is the 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 collaboration, inclusiveness, non discrimination, and settled dispute based on rules. So we cannot forget yeah. about those parts, the valuable part of the DNA, before we start reforming it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry to the organizers that we, we are running a little late and I see people getting anxious in the room. So please, um, if there's questions in the room, I think we should give priority to, to, to people who have questions there before I turn to the online participants. Uh, thank you, Joost. And uh, I, I can assure you there's no anxiety in this room. Um, okay, good. <laughs> and if anything, it's positive. Uh, so my name is Marcus Wagner for the benefit of those who, are, who might only see me in a very small uh, online, um, one of the executive vice presidents of SEAL. Uh, I want to first of all, thank you, uh, express our gratitude to the um, participants because I know at least for two of them, it's extremely late. Um, and, and living in Australia, I can tell you, I know how that feels. Um, uh, but uh, for now, what I would like to do is uh, just ask, I will come around with a microphone. If you want to just raise your hand, uh, I'll come around. Uh, for the benefit again for the uh, of of the speakers, since we don't have cameras trained on you, could you, you just please state your name and then ask your question? So, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hands now. Now I'm getting anxious if no one raises their hand. Asking to pass. 
Hi, uh, thank you very much for this session. My name is Anna Perez, and I would like to ask a question related to this last point about the WTO reform and plurilateral. So yeah, we all been discussing how important the joint statement initiatives are and how important plurilateral agreements uh, can be in the WTO as a tool to move forward. But yeah, I would like to ask, so why do members last week, they stated that they are aiming for a multilateral agreement with the investment facilitation agreement? So why not uh, choose the plurilateral uh, approach or the plurilateral option in this case? Thank you. Marcus, we you want to take a few questions or? Yeah, I'm, I'm still looking for raised hands here. So um, uh, if. There is one, so uh, Peter Vandenbosch, who needs no introduction. Um, I'm going to turn to the camera because then I think um, the panelists can see me. Uh, there were uh, several references to the importance of a functional WTO dispute settlement system. And my question to the panel is, how realistic it is, is it that there will be a fully functioning dispute settlement system in 2024. We have two more hands raised up. I'll just go in the order that I see them. Uh, Gabriele Marceau. Good morning, good afternoon. My question is about whether you think there's a need to change the way the WTO, um, I don't want to say secretariat, but the components of the WTO, because if I refer to what Professor Laffer said, diplomacy of standard, and the fact that different countries have different situation, what will be terribly important is to compare actions and initiative by different countries. This will require expertise that the WTO doesn't have. We're gonna need much more environmentalists, engineers, and all that. So dealing with climate change may require a completely, I don't want to say new staff, but don't you think uh, new additional expertise? And that's also a challenge budget-wise. We have one more hand that I saw raised from Henry Gao. So maybe then we'll turn over to you, uh, Jules. Thank you, Marcus. I'm going to stand up and face the camera so as to see the fellow panelists. So I'm going to fo uh, follow up on uh, one question that was raised uh, uh, by the panelists and also by Peter regarding the dispute settlement system. Given that um, you know the likelihood of getting the uh, petty body and therefore functioning dispute settlement system back is rather slim. So would this change the negotiation dynamics of the WTO? Because now, if the WTO doesn't have a functional uh, dispute settlement system, it would be like uh, the other UN agencies. Wouldn't it make it easier for the WTO members uh, paradoxically to reach agreements? Uh, and actually, we already see some of that happening, right? Because we saw these prolateral agreements, there's no guarantee that they are going to be subject to dispute settlement mechanism. So I will welcome uh, any comments from the panel in that regard. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So we have four questions on the investment facilitation agreement. Why the multilateral ambition uh, dispute settlement? Two questions. Is it going to happen? Um, if it's not happening, wouldn't that be a good thing in some way? And then Gabriel's question on the secretariat and, and the need for different expertise. Who, who I saw, I, I would like to turn first to perhaps um, Ambassador Laffer, because you didn't get a chance to comment, please. Uh, I think you're still muted. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you. I think Gabriel has Gabriel has made a very interesting point. The, the WTO secretary is of the highest quality, and uh, she knows how much I praise the secretary. But if we are going to deal with these issues of environment and a diplomacy of standards, as I mentioned, it should be strengthened in order to deal with these issues that the environment requires. And to deal with them, bearing in mind the interchange with other multilateral environmental agreements. And the fact that they are different mechanisms through which these issues are being discussed and raised. 
Yet, I think this is a fundamental point, and it would be very relevant if the WTO would and its members would look at it seriously. On dispute settlement, which I think is fundamental and is what uh, has differentiated the WTO from other international organizations, apart from the possibility of arbitration that is also contemplated in the DSU, uh, we I'm convinced that unless we are able to revive the dispute settlement and the appellate body, uh, we will not be able to maintain the specificity that the WTO has in the international scene of international organizations. The only idea I have for the time being is the issue of arbitration that can be eventually developed in terms of uh, a potential for the future. Thank you, Ignacio and Cleet. I saw your hands up, and and then I want to turn to yeah. Ambassador uh, Professor Dow and, and Minister Ahn. Cleet, you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, let me let me focus, and I'll be brief. I know we're over already. Let me let me focus on the DS questions. Um, first of all, I mean, let, let me let me take the second, the last one first. I mean, I, I actually think. If there's no dispute settlement system, no functioning dispute settlement system, it will be very bad for the system um, because I think it will just become increasingly less relevant. Uh, I can say that you know trade folks, you know the, the fact that people pay so much attention to it and raise the bar for agreeing to things is a good thing. We don't want it to become an organization, uh, at least from the U.S. perspective, where we just kind of say, well, it doesn't really matter what they agree to because it's not binding, and I'm not that worried about it. Like that would be bad for the system. So even if it facilitated some sort of agreement, I don't think it would be a net plus for uh, the multilateral system. And so I, I feel pretty strongly about that. In terms of whether or not there will be a functioning system by 2024, um, let me, I, don't, I don't mean to be cute, <laughs> but I guess it depends on how you define functioning system. I mean, I, it, the last time I checked, we've still got panels uh, that are going through, that are making decisions. Um, and that's enabling some countries to resolve disputes between them. Um, I, I believe that we should have an appellate body, um, but I also believe that to having panels that can adjudicate things is good. And in some respects, uh, that's one model for a dispute settlement system as well. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical that we get some grand bargain at MC13 that solves all of our problems. Um, so, I, I will have skepticism there, but I will add, I will end with one note of optimism in my last intervention, which is we've come a long way uh, since when Madam Zhao and I were two delegates in Geneva talking about these issues and doing dispute settlement with each other. And, and the conversation in Geneva about the need to change and reform and how the system can work better, I think has been a very healthy evolution. Um, so even though I don't think we're necessarily going to get there by MC13, I am optimistic that over time we can get back to something uh, that is workable in Geneva. Um, and I think we all got to be open minded that it may not look exactly like it did in 1995 or in 2017, um, but that it still can play a healthy function that keeps the system relevant. Thank you, Cleet. Um, Who wants to go? Ignacio, did I see your hand up in the beginning? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, no, but first let me say that I am happy again to agree with Cleet uh, on the answer to the question. I think it was from Henry Gao. There is no way that you can actually have a functioning WTO without having the functioning dispute settlement system. There is already the option of entering into non-binding uh, understanding. That's always a possibility. But at the end of the day, if you don't have rules which can be enforced, there will be no motivation to negotiate uh, new rules. So from that point of view, it is very clear for me that uh, the question of having a functioning dispute settlement system is existential for the WTO. How optimistic you can be about uh, getting into an outcome by 2024, it is not my job as a trade negotiator to be optimistic uh, or pessimistic. The reality is that we're having very, very intensive discussions and quite constructive discussions, I have to say, in Geneva on trying to find a, a way forward on a significant reform of the dispute settlement system. 
For us, of course, it is critical that any reform system maintains the core characteristics of the system that we created in 1995. It has to be a system which is binding, where you cannot have things like appeals into the void, and you need to have a credible second tier to adjudicate and correct errors of law. It's not going to be the same system that we have in 1995, but I think the critical components of, 90, of the 1995 agreement need to continue to be there. We will be able, would we be able to solve those issues by MC13? We will be able to solve it by 2024. As I said, the only thing which I can say is that there's a strong determination to try to go as fa far as possible to try to find uh, where there is a potential landing zone. Of course, it is there's no agreement. There are other options. Many of you are, of course, aware about the multi-party interim arbitration agreement, which is, of course, open for other countries to join. But we very much hope that it will be possible to find a multilateral uh, solution. On the very good question raised by Gabriel, I think inevitably it's also going to require for this solution to see more cooperation between the WTO secretariat and other international organizations, very much along the, along the lines of what Ambassador Laffer mentioned before. I mean, it's clearly we're going to have meaningful discussions in the Committee on Trade and Environment on issues like how to measure carbon embedded emissions. We have the different methodologies that can be used for that purpose. You need to be able to rely on technical expertise, which is not necessarily in the WTO Secretariat, and you will need to see how it is possible to also bring to the discussion expertise which comes from other places than the WTO. So I think, in my view, that's going to be inevitably part of the job of getting a better deliberating function in the WTO on issues like the interface between trade and the environment. Thank you, Ignacio. Minister Anne, so, some views from, from your perspective? Yes, uh, briefly. Actually, I echo the, the Cleet and the Ignacio's uh, comment. Um, uh, it will be difficult to, uh, to see uh, the previous appellate body system working like uh, we used to see uh, by 2024. But, uh, uh, but members uh, uh, feel the urgency uh, much more, and the members are actually behaving uh, in much better way. And as you can see, uh, one example is even the United States uh, decided to adopt uh, the, the panel report uh, in which they lost the safeguard decision. And actually, uh, I worked for almost a year for, uh, it took almost a year to, to work with the US government uh, to adopt this panel decision. So uh, uh, despite uh, the huge objection by the US government, actually they uh, announced uh, some statements uh, the, the saying that uh, there are error in the interpretation uh, in the decision, but still uh, we agreed to adopt that decision. So uh, even US is moving back to the table. And then as Ignacio uh, uh, explained, uh, now the members are uh, actually very seriously engaged in the, the W2 dispute settlement uh, reform uh, negotiation. So sooner or later, probably we will be able to uh, work on the, the drafting uh, work on a few uh, important issues. So uh, we are moving that way, but it'll take a little more time. Um, thank, yeah. thank you. Uh, Professor Dow, you have the final word, and I'm so sorry, you were running 10 minutes late, but I think we started a bit late. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for this opportunity, as I think I will first address uh, Peter's and Henry's issue uh, pro uh, question on dispute settlement. I think that I'm a little bit, um, how to see, uh, my attitude is that let's look and see. I'm less, uh, how to say, uh, I, I don't think it's bleak, the outcome, the, the, currently I won't say it is bleak. And also I think, uh, I agree with plea that we should have a palabody and to Peter's question, you know, what is a fully, fully functioning uh, dispute settlement by 2024? In order to have a fully functioning dispute settlement, you have to have a pallet body as there are so many appeals, appeal to the void body. How do you resolve that issue? No, I didn't say that it is easy 
it will be a you know uphill battle. It will be very difficult, but we should remember that we not only need to address the concerns of one member, we need to address the concerns of the majority. That is an international democracy, as I said, we can't forget about that. And let's sit down and forget about those arrogance or the big tree or whatever. Let's try to come down and say, you know, frankly, objectively, what are the problems of peace settlement at World Trade Organization? What is it merit? What is merit? And how do we continue to carry on the mandate from, you know, long ago? As please said, you know, from it's a long way ago that we, we find all these matters. Yes, we there are many, many things to, to recall, but we resolve those disputes for so many years, for so many years. So I think the uh, we I just I just want to say let's wait and see. Leave the room for members and let's keep some hope in our heart. At least I always cherish a hope how difficult that situation will be. Otherwise, why should we communicate and having this, you know, dialogue uh, late into the night? So, uh, and on the Gabrette question on the secretary, I also, you know, I feel very sad recently that I either see people, my old friend in the secretary retired or are going to retire. We have a whole generation of, you know, changing of the team. It is, it is a generational, how to say, I don't want, it is very, uh, I'm not, uh, I think this uh, kind of uh, nostalgia, I should say. It's very nostalgia going there and see so many people I'm familiar with gone. As at the time of the uh, establishment of the World Trade Organization, the staff, the senior staff, start, we start to lose those institu institutional memories. So let's try to keep those memories. I think that is the treasure part of the civilization, of mankind. I, I don't want to say too much. I have many lectures in that regard, and I fully believe this is the something we treasure and we should consider how we can carry on this part, the best part of the rule, the rule of law internationally. No, I think I stop here. I know uh, it you. is too late. Thank you. Thank you. That was very useful to remind us of this. Um, thank you to, to the five panelists, uh, and especially those where it's really, really late by now. Uh, Marcus, I turn the floor back to you, and I hope someone in the room will answer question number one on investment facilitation. Uh, we'll, we'll see to that. Uh, thank you, Jos. Um, can I just uh, uh, express our sincere gratitude from Seal for all of the panelists to join? Um, and, and invite uh, the, pan the, the audience to. I will say we were slightly apprehensive about this panel and only because it spanned many time zones, uh, took a lot of sort of coordination uh, and, and, uh, and again, let me thank the, the, the panelists and also of course Yost uh, for, for coordinating this in such an expert fashion and, and, and moderating in such an expert fashion. Um,